Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're in downtown Cleveland at the annual health physics meeting, and it's uh, Wednesday, the 13th of June. And uh, I have two old and close friends and, and associates that, uh, surprisingly enough, instead of my introducing uh, um, someone else to be questioned, uh, I'm going to be questioned. Which, which should be fun because we've spent a lot of years together learning together. Uh, I'm Sidney Porter, the chairman of the History Committee, and on my left is Fraser Bronson, uh, and on my right is Lee Booth. These are uh, both uh, ex-chairmen of the American Board of Health Physics and uh, people that have long and very illustrious careers in health physics. But the uh, tide has turned, and these guys are going to be answer, asking the questions now. And hopefully, I'll be able to have a few of the answers in any case. So uh, I'll, I'll start by saying I was born in Baltimore in 32. I was always interested in chemistry and explosives as a little kid, having blown up many, many a driveway of my parents' house. And uh, went to St. John's College, uh, Liberal Arts College, and then to Hopkins, Johns Hopkins. And then after that, I went to work for the Glen L. Martin Company in 1956 as, uh, quote, a physical chemist. But I was the guy on the bottom of the totem pole and uh, ended up having to do health physics also, besides being a physical chemist. Because sadly, no one else wanted to do the, the health physics for the early prototype reactors that Glen L. Martin was working on then. And so we sort of went from there, and uh, these fellows can kind of start asking me questions now about, about uh, <laughs> what happened. So was that how you got into this, this, this health physics field? I mean, yeah, I thought did, I was going to be a physical Any idea chemist. of what health physics was before Martin? No. I, I'd never even heard the term, as a matter of fact. In graduate school, it, uh, when you're in chemical engineering and physical chemistry, uh, it, it seems like sort of a very minor thing. Uh, I had this uh, job that looked pretty exciting, doing some new work uh, at uh, Glen L. Martin Company Nuclear Division. And, and I had to wait six months to get my clearances before I found out even what they did. So, I had no so idea what, what they you, did. So what yeah. were your initial tasks at, at this job? What uh, were they asking you to do? So? Uh, the second stage propellant of our first missile in space, and by the way, we were hearing Sputnik go by every day too, which gave an awful lot of pressure to this job, uh, was unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine. And it had to be irradiated to find out whether or not a sunspot would destroy its effective energy so that we would not have the missile lift off properly. And they were so scared that it was going to blow up and nothing was going to happen that we weren't allowed to tell anybody what we were working on <laughs> at all. Because if it, if, it, if, it, uh, if it failed, then we weren't going to tell the nation that our first attempt failed. They were just going to do another one. <laughs> and the whole thing was labeled top secret, not secret, top secret. So it took me six months uh, just to get a clearance to be able to find out what I was doing. Uh, and we had to bring some cobalt uh, pencils down from um, Brookhaven National Lab to put in a pool. There had been an old experimental reactor in there. Uh, and um, uh, the guy on the bottom of the totem pole got to bring it down. And therefore, we had to learn, well, what are the problems involved if you're going to bring that down? And at the same time, I heard about this new society being formed, the Health Physics Society. And I asked to be able to go, and was told, no, you can't go. Uh, um, uh, we're, we're too busy, you're still working 12 hours a day, you can't take time off to go to this new Health Physics Society meeting. So uh, just to shut me up, they paid my dues. <laughs> but they didn't let, I didn't go for three years. <laughs> they wouldn't let me go. And so I never, even so I joined, uh, they, did, they didn't uh, allow me uh, to, uh, to, go to, uh, to go to the meetings. And it was only after I went to Electric Boat Company and started working on the prototype nuclear submarines as assistant health physics coordinator under Joe Logston, that I really began to learn uh, really what health physics was, was all about. And so it was pretty uh, hit or miss uh, back then, as a matter of fact, as far as, the, as, far as being, uh, how can I say, uh, professionally competent. Yeah, I know. Both 
maybe the audience doesn't know, both Lee and I started out uh, our careers working for Sid at uh, AFRI, but and I've talked to you a lot of times. I forgot about that whole uh, Martin experience. I remember a lot of stories about the uh, your early days at Electric Boat, uh, and uh, I'm sure you had some uh, very exciting uh, health physics learning experiences there in the early days of the uh, nuclear uh, propulsion program. Uh, any of those stories that are interesting enough but uh, sane enough to share with us? Well, uh, I do remember that I believe it was the skate, which was the third nuclear submarine made, came back in. And in those days, they used to dump the resins at sea, the spent resins at sea. And apparently, they were a little late in doing that. And they were speeding back in because it was Friday evening and the crew had been out for two months and they wanted to let the crew go. And instead of being submerged 20 feet down, they're only about two feet down. So part of the superstructure was almost above the water. And so when they dumped the resins out, it stuck in the, in the upper superstructure uh, behind the sail. And there was probably not a lot, maybe 20 or 40 millicuries of material. But this was, this was older material with long half-lives. And it wasn't the short stuff that would go away. And these people come in Friday evening about 8 o'clock. There are 120 in a crew. And there's all of the uh, family waiting for them to get off the boat. And we do a couple of quick smears and release them. We did a couple of quick smears, brought them in, and we contaminated the whole counting lab. <laughs> so we, we knew we were in trouble. Well, I was like 15 people down from the president at least. And it's 7 o'clock on Friday evening, and so I don't allow the crew off. And so, the, and so I just call the president's office and say, we have a real problem. Well, the president's not here. Well, you know, I went on down. It turned out I was a reigning person on site, <laughs> which was ludicrous. And so the, uh, the admiral, the supervisor of shipbuilding, calls over and says, I want those people's released. And this is after an hour of trying to find out what was going on. And it turned out the entire after superstructure of the deck was contaminated. They had walked on this and then gone back down to the submarine, contaminated uh, uh, several levels of the upper levels of the submarine. And you know, the wooden deck's an electric boat. You can't let people with a lot of contamination walk on wooden decks because you can't contaminate wood or decontaminate wood. And so we held them, and there was a huge hoorah rah about this. And uh, that was Friday night. I get called in. I had the weekend off. I get called in on Sunday, and there's Admiral Rickover sitting in there, sitting in, <laughs> in the president's office. I'd never been in the president's office before, by the way. I'd never even stepped foot in. And so I thought to myself, this is it. <laughs> I, I've just ended a short career, and, and I'm out of here, because Rickover was famous for firing people who did anything wrong at all. And he had absolute authority to fire anybody left me boat, by the way. No one ever said boo to him about that. And so... Uh, he never looked at me, Rickover, and he just said, I understand you're the son of a bitch that kept 120 of my crew members for four and a half hours when they should have been only kept for 10 minutes, they claim. And I said, yes, sir. Uh, I had to keep these docks from being contaminated, and I did the best I could. And I thought, this is it. And he never looked at me. He was kind of a rude guy. And he looked at Shug, the president of, of Electric Boat, and he said, well, at least you have one son of a bitch that knows what he's doing. Now get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that was my only time I talked directly <laughs> to Rickover, if you want to call it a, a direct talk. <laughs> and so uh, it turned out it was like 20 to 40 millicuries for the total activity. But in those days, it cost almost a half a million dollars to clean it up. We, and the bad thing was that we were keeping an essential submarine at, off of sea duty. And Rickover was furious. And there were, very quietly, three or four people demoted, lost their stripes over this. I mean, he, 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 uh, he didn't, there was not wasn't much room for serious error. And this was considered a very serious error. I learned a huge amount about uh, what to, uh, you know, how to respond to an emergency. And one of them was that you always want to have the decontamination barge in between the submarine and the dock. And that's inviolate rule. I locked out. It was there then. It hadn't always been there up to then. But after that, it was always there. Uh, we, we, we were just so fortunate that nothing else happened there. There were days, by the way, where the fallout would give us two and three million D per M 
on the windshields. And that really made environmental monitoring impossible, by the way, when we had, had those really bad fallout days. Uh, th th those were, um, but I guess the, the biggest learning was the, you know, the wonderful people that I was able to work with. Jack Shapiro was head of radiological engineering, which worked side by side with health physics. And I had the wonderful experience of working with Jack and learning so much about sampling techniques that he was a master at, by the way. Uh, and um, Murray Miles is, is another person that was fantastic. And my boss, Joe Logston, who unfortunately left after I was there for about three years, uh, was a wonderful guy that had trained at Oak Ridge uh, in their master's program. And so I'm just so happy to have, you know, to have a beginning where I had people that knew what they were doing, because I sure didn't when I went in there. It was, you know, I, I was really frightened about that job for a while. What, but, what was the job there officially in radiation protection yes, or health physics? Yes. Okay. Right. It, it was. It was officially the radiation safety department, and they had to. Call, and Joe was the coordinator. Joe Logston, and I was the assistant coordinator. And then uh, Joe left about three or four years later, and then I was coordinator for the other three years there, which was essentially the majority of all the prototypes they had. After that, they fixed on the S5W, and they made a hundred and some S5W plants. But it was an exciting time to be there because the mistakes were being made and we were learning from them. And so, and so that was one of the, one of the, one of the fun things. And, and then amazingly, oh, in 1961, I, I left there in 62, uh, a year before I had met this uh, co-ed at Connecticut College for Women. And by the way, I was just teaching basic grad physics up there since they didn't have a physicist on staff. It was a nice place for a bachelor to teach uh, at night. And I met this young lady, uh, Lynn Connie, and a year and a half later in 61, I, I married her. And then in 62, I went down to the AEC to interview for a job. Uh, by the way, they had offered me to grandfather me in uh, on the ABHP exam, because I had started early. And I thought about it, and I kind of searched my conscience. And I said, would well, it be nice to have a certification of some kind? I didn't quite understand what it was, by the way, but I sort of knew. But then I thought, well, that's kind of cheating because I only know this tiny field of reactor health physics and every other health physicist I've met at a meeting is doing different things than I am. And I don't know anything about all these other fields. I can't even spell them almost, it was so bad, the, my lack of education or experience. And so I decided, and I think rightly so in retrospect, not to grandfather in, but to go get another job where I would have a more expanded uh, uh, type of health physics. And so I, I thought I was going to work for the AEC. And I went down and I interviewed. And while I was there, I heard about this place called AFRI. And they were interviewing for a health physicist to run the department. I looked at the job description. And I remember saying to my wife, Lynn, nobody that I know but Casey Morgan could fill this job. I didn't know who Herb Parker was in those days. <laughs> and, so, and I threw the job description in the, in the waste can. And Lynn picked it up and looked at it and she said, well, I, I know somebody who worked for the government and they claim that every job description the government ever writes is overwritten. <laughs> and I, I had no experience, I didn't know that. And so, and she said, well, while you're all the way down in Washington, and it was a long trip in those days, there were no super highways, no, no interstates at that point. Um, while you're all the way down there, why don't you just interview for this thing? And so it was a lark. I said, all right, I guess I will as long as I'm there. And so I allowed a two-hour time period for this interview, which is what I was told it would take. And my brother, uh, Michael, and my wife, Lynn, went down with me. And I left them in a bar in Georgetown and drove up to Bethesda for this two-hour interview. Started maybe 2 in the afternoon. I'd been at the AEC all morning. Then we had lunch together. And then I came to this, uh, I came to this interview. And it was supposed to go from 2 to 4. Well, anyway, uh, next time I looked at my watch, it was 5 o'clock. And the interview was still going full force. And I was doing mostly asking questions. There was so much I didn't know, it was unbelievable. So I was just asking questions. I lucked out. I must have asked the right questions. Because after, oh, by the way, the job interview went to seven. I had a $150 bar bill. My brother didn't have any money at all. <laughs> so all he did was drink and put it on top. And I had to write a check. I didn't have that kind of money either. Luckily, I had a credit card with me <laughs> so, to pay the bar bill. Because instead of getting it back at 4, I got back at 7.30. <laughs> and they had just uh, proceeded to get plowed. And 
A month later, much to my amazement, they offered me the job. I was sure that I wasn't going to get it. I was the most surprised guy in the world. But apparently, they were most worried about the trigger that they put in. Because at the mm -hmm. time, it was the highest pulsing trigger that had, had ever been made. I didn't realize how worried they were about that. And so they took all my lack of experience and decided that I'd write, I had asked the right questions and maybe I'd be able to learn. Because I really didn't, compared to the other people that I had heard about that had interviewed for the job, I figured there's no way, no possible way. And so I, it was lucky, I think. It was just pure luck that I, that I got that job. Who was interviewing? Was, was it anybody Jim, that... Oh, uh, Jim Brennan, you, okay. uh, Les Senior, Howard Dowling. I mean, all the, a lot of senior, um, a couple of radiologists that they had there. Um, who was the Air Force uh, Colonel? Oh, I wish I was a fat little guy. Anyway, th th there were a whole... <laughs> Careful now, they're taping. <laughs> <laughs> there were a whole series of, of veteran people. You know, th all these people had been out at Bikini. There were real veterans, like uh, Jim Brennan. You know, well, what was the structure of the health physics staff? At yeah, that was there any at that time? Yeah. Yes, there was like three technicians and Bud Biles. I don't know if you, did you guys he was, ever? He yeah. was an ex-Navy chief. Wasn't yes, right. ex-Navy chief. And most of the work was being done ad hoc. They hadn't started up the reactor yet. And uh, all they were doing was just ordering instruments and so it was mainly things. laboratory yeah, yeah, sources that they had, small things. Right. At that time. They, they didn't have much, uh, but they were kind of scared. They knew that they were going to get an accelerator. They knew that they were going to make sources in the hot cells. They had put the DTO in uh, for the thermal neutron room, so, so we, we can make. So so we knew that we were going to have a lot of things going on. Yeah. So did you represent the first? Professional level health physicist at Afrin. I guess I guess you I guess you could call it that. I'm not sure so sure how professional I was, <laughs> but I did represent it. I guess uh, uh, because of the fact that they had a number of people that had ex weapons test experience that were kind of filling in, waiting to find the right person, and um, it was kind of a frightening thing because I saw all the things we had to do, and so um, and. The first couple of military people they sent me were interested in doing radiobiology or something else. So they would come in and I'd lose them before, <laughs> before they even got assigned to my department. So that was kind of frustrating too. And at that point, it was obvious to me I was going to have to find my own people and not defend, depend on the military to send somebody in. Although actually a little later on, I got John Kendig, you know, who was a really good, well-trained from Wright Pad, a well-trained health physicist. But that didn't happen for a number of years. And so it was just, you know, uh, building things up. Uh, I was pretty comfortable with the reactor because after having worked on the problems that I worked with in the Naval Reactors Program, uh, you know, this reactor was really a puddle jumper. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem was how much argon were we going to dump out over the, over the AEC building and were they ever going to be clever enough to figure out that we were doing it? So and it turns might, out they never did. You might oh, no, they did many something. years later, yeah. <laughs> <You might laughs> after explain. we were all let gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> you might explain to some of our viewers exactly what AFRI was. Some yeah. of them oh. may not have been familiar. Oh, yeah. This, kind of interesting and, work and all the been. radiological uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, toys really, there. Yeah. Really a terrific place to be. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. I'm sorry. AFRI is the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute. And uh, actually, when it, um, it was formed by the five Surgeon Generals of the United States, they, they were the board of directors. Jim Brennan was the visionary, a radiologist with a, with a strong physics background, uh, who had had a lot of experience at Los Alamos. He knew Wright Langham. Uh, at Hanford, he was personal friends with Herb Parker, and uh, had been on a number of bomb tests with wonderful stories about this. Uh, and he wanted to, he saw that one of the big problems with radiobiology research has existed in the United States uh, in the 50s was that just about every single thing that had been done except for Russell's mouse work was statistically insignificant. And that they had to have a facility where they could do thousands of rats or mice or monkeys or whatever they wanted to do at a time. And they also wanted to have something where they would have a spectrum that would uh, represent the fission spectrum from the weapons. And then as they developed a uh, fusion weapon, then he wanted to be able to have the neutron spectrum also. 
And so this was kind of a daunting task just to build up all these physical facilities. And so what they did is they, they had uh, General Atomic design the highest pulse reactor that, that they had ever designed and, and put in there for large pulses for the reactor. Uh, we had a hot cell facility where we could make our own standards, which was awfully nice. Um, they uh, had in place a design to put in a large cobalt facility, which they actually put in after I left, as I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but just barely after you left because yeah. you were involved with all of the design work and all yeah. of the preparatory work. Lots of, and also uh, they were going to put in a, a huge, and they did actually put in a huge uh, accelerator which would be capable of giving us the same flux as a 20 megaton fusion weapon. And there were lots of neutron problems with that and target problems were horrendous. As a matter of fact, there was also a small Cockroft Walton machine that we had to do low flux uh, 14 MeV ne neutron work with. And I also got to do some wonderful things, but the point is that the, um, the AFRI facilities were the largest set of facilities that the world had ever seen for radiobiology research. And they were able to get the funding from about five other facilities, such as NRDL, that they shut down. And they shut down three or four classified research things that were around the Naval Medical Center that weren't well known at the time. Uh, and all the dollars went in here. And as a matter of fact, for a number of years, I used to get hell for not spending enough money, not having enough people, et cetera, which I'm sure I'll never have that problem again. But, <laughs> but it was a fascinating thing. And one of my um, first jobs was to get really good people. And I was really fortunate to be able to look at resumes of, of literally hundreds of people that had been drafted in the military services. And I was able to uh, also, uh, uh, I'm not sure how I got your resume, Fraser. <laughs> I can't remember how that happened. But I saw the resume and I saw, you know, you're obviously a bright, well-trained person. And I thought, boy, it'd be great if I could get Fraser Bronson to come to work. And there was Les Slayback and Lee Booth and Bill Weber, uh, Bill. John Aberly, uh, John Bill Powers. Harris. Bill Powers? No, he left after the service. Oh. But, but he was there during yeah, the He was there. Yeah, Bill Powers right. was there too. Yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of, of, of incredibly good scientists. And I, I was lucky. I was really Lou plain Pitchford lucky. Was, was there? What's Lou that? Pitchford was oh, there. Lou Pitchford, and, yes, not in our group, but right. uh, there. Uh, Harold Wyckoff? Oh, well, Harold Wyckoff became our boss after Jim Brennan yeah. left. I mean, it was just a lot of people that, were, that oh, went on to do very class. good things in, uh, in our field. Uh, Absolutely. We were there. done before they came, like yeah. Harold Wyckoff. Huh. And, we were, and we had, among other things, in the early days, Joe Sag came for a year right. and taught classes. And there were incredibly good classes on mixed neutron gamma measurements. Um, let me see. Uh, also, Jim Brennan was personal friends with Herb Parker and Hoyt Whipple. And one of the first things he did before any of you guys came was to send me out. I thought I was going to be sent to Oak Ridge. He said, no. He said, I want to send you where, there, where the best health physics program in the world exists today. And that's at Hanford under Herb Parker. So I, get, I got sent out for six months to go from, uh, from division to division to division of the health physics group there and to get a feel for what real health physics was like. That was my first uh, electric boat was very narrow in scope compared to that. That really opened up my eyes. That was, that was excellence that I didn't dream or imagine existed. Also, it gave me people to talk to, which was wonderful to be able to call these people and ask questions. Stupid as some of them might be, have been, <laughs> I was able to ask. And then to have really good workers, hard working people like you all. I can say that probably of all the things that, I, that have happened to me in my professional life, I guess one of the things I'm most proud of is the, the accomplishments of, of Les Slayback and Fraser and Lee in the professional work that you all have done and all that you've given to the profession. And that's something that uh, I'm indeed fortunate to, uh, to be able to be associated with with you all, really. It was, it was just a, uh, a, you know, it was just 
the, the days at AFRI were wonderful days that they put me on this inspector general's team and sent me to, well, the Fort Belvoir one was, you know, I, I never saw, you know, sometimes the Army didn't do things in the best possible way, but we stopped the, the dumping of things into the Virginia waters right away and got rid, of the, got rid of a few problems there. The nice thing about the inspector general's team is that you could never challenge the findings. The only thing you could say is how long it was going to take you to take care of the deficiency. And so it was, it was like having the power of the Lord practically when you went. So you had to be very careful that you didn't lord it over people and, and, and ask too much. But um, I did get to go to Antarctica, which was an incredible experience for me, uh, and, uh, and, and also to Panama, uh, uh, working, for, working for the Inspector General, and, and to hire some people like John Aris. John was a wonderful person. <laughs> who uh, a, a number of years later would come up to, at, uh, after the TMI accident. And he must have called me 20 times before he came up. <laughs> but, but he finally came up. And as sick as he was, uh, he, he worked and was happy. He was happy to be there. And you know, I made him bring a doctor's letter before he'd come, because I was afraid that, that that kind of hard work was, was really, really going to hurt him a lot. But while I was at AFRI, I did pass my boards, which was awfully nice. Good. I studied and, pa and passed the boards. Uh, and, um, well, by the way, Jim Brennan was also interested in medical physics. Uh, he had me over at the Naval Medical Center under Roy Scal for a while, working in medical physics. And I, um, I had a choice of whether to take the AAPM exam or the health physics exam. Uh -oh. I, I, your, your I, was... I looked at the, at the past exams and decided that the health physics exam was really a tougher exam to take. And I better go ahead and take that one while, while I was in the studying mood. <laughs> and that I did. And I, uh, I studied with a number of medical physicists. And then we went back afterwards and took each other's exams. And those guys did terrible on the health physics exam. And, the, and I forget who took it with me. Uh, uh, but the two or three of us took the AAP exam and aced it. Uh, that would never be the case now, of course. Weren't you also involved uh, with the uh, beginnings of that uh, Baltimore Washington chapter uh, certification prep course? Oh, yes. Mike Turpelak and I, uh, Mike was one of the guys we studied together, put together a class. And I, I called uh, Forrest Western at the uh, AEC and said, I need two or $3,000 to put together a prep class and explain what I wanted to do. And I want to know whether he could bring people in from around the national labs to help teach. And he said, fine. And that's all I had to do in those days is call and ask, which was kind of nice. And so we put together the first ABHP prep class with a, with a for the time, not a bad manual. Uh, uh, and so that was a lot of fun doing, and, uh, and also uh, a great method to study. And so it, it, was a, it was a twofer. There we studied, and we also had fantastic people to come in to teach us, which which helps us, which which gave me all the information to put together uh, that uh, first guide for uh, studying that uh, we uh, uh, put together. Uh, somehow I passed the boards. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how, but I really did, and um, uh, that that was a, a real highlight in my professional life, passing those boards and. Uh, bother, one of the things that bothered me was that I was not, I was not registered with the civil service as a health physicist because there were no health physicists. There was no health physics register. Civil service didn't have one. We were registered. We were classified as chemists, and we could only go to GS14, and that's as high as you could go. And so what I did is to go bitch the civil service board, and they said, "All right, do something about it." So I went back to Brennan and said, well, well, I need some time and some money to pull some people together. And what I did with some help of about four or five other fine people was to, I was chair of a committee that wrote the first civil service uh, standards for health, health physicists. And we also put in the, the certification that was needed for GS 14 and 15 levels uh, and got that rammed through the Civil Service Commission which took a little while to do, but it, it did work. And it also created the 15 level, which was important, mm -hmm. because all those guys at the AEC were, were either having to go to public law or, or stay at 14. <laughs> OK? 
<laughs> which is a terrible situation. And so I was, I was so glad to be able to do that. It was self-serving too, because you know, I was looking at that 15 saying, well, in a year or two, you know, that would be uh, nice to have. And while I was doing that, I was um, started doing some consulting. And the most interesting job I had was up at the University of Pennsylvania uh, for a fellow we call the Iron Duke, uh, Richard Chamberlain who <laughs> I'm sure Fraser remembers, and, and I don't know if you remember him or not, but he was the radiation safety spokesman for the American College of Radiology, and an incredibly powerful guy because he owned the entire radiology department at the University of Pennsylvania. At the Which time. NCRP report did he write, or uh, was the, the prime author of uh, one of those on ra radiation? Oh. Well, he was, on, he was on the main committee, yeah. so he wrote a number of reports, and I don't remember which one. Jim Brennan also was on the main right. committee. And, of course, Herb Parker, who I talked about before, was the guy that wrote the radiation protection philosophy for our country. Okay. And he did that two or three yeah. times. He updated it two or three times, even so not being closely involved with the Health Physics Society, sadly. But uh, working with uh, Dick Chamberlain, and then Jim Brennan was up there as uh, professor of research radiology at University of Pennsylvania. We started to work on the consulting, started to, we spent a couple of years, I did part-time weekends, holidays, uh, working on the idea of a new company, which we finally decided to call Radiation Management Corporation. And I made a crucial mistake in that. I was offered the presidency and I said, no, the way this company looks to me, it's going to be 90% medical work and 10% health physics work. I couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> and so I said, we have to have a physician as president of this company. I'll take the number two job. Uh, so Jim Brennan found a, a radiologist that uh, didn't want to practice radiology, and he seemed to be the ideal person to be president. And so uh, Roger Lineman was brought in as president, and I took the number two job. And uh, I uh, looked around for uh, people, and I had the greatest respect for Fraser and uh, for Lee too. And and uh, Fraser came up uh, fairly soon after after uh, we incorporated, as I remember. Sixty nine. Uh, well, just before you were incorporated. Okay, it, it might have been just, just about before. a year after you left Africa. Yeah. And so I, I know I know you came up pretty early in in the stages there for what was an exciting concept, uh, Radiation Management Corporation, it really was. Uh, the bottom line was that within 150 miles of Philadelphia, there uh, were at that point and still are more uh, nuclear power reactors than anywhere else in the United States in that radius. And so they wanted to have a facility that could take care of the mixed trauma patient, the uh, medical trauma plus some kind of radiation exposure contamination uh, problem. And so, in order to keep things busy, I was first told, well, you guys can just go to meetings. And I said, you know, that ain't going to work. We, we have to have something that keeps the lab sharp. We put all this money into laboratories. They have, they have to be used. This can't sit there. And so, the, uh, this was the early days we were talking about the concept. And so, we decided to do, uh, to offer environmental monitoring uh, services. It was still envisioned at that point that we would have more MDs than health physicists. Really? Yes. Well, remember, uh, it's, uh, it's Brennan and Chamberlain <laughs> and uh, Bill Betch, Dr. Betch from Philadelphia Electric. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, there were more people on the board of directors that were, that were medical than, than were health physics related. It was later on that uh, they brought in Herb Parker and Hoyt Whipple for a while, remember? Okay, yeah. Uh, who was one of my favorite iconoclasts that I've ever met. I, I just loved his sense of humor and his way of taking a complicated problem and crystallizing it down and giving you the nitty gritty. You know, sometimes it stuck in your crawl the way he did it, but the point is he was right and he knew it. Uh, and I, I, just, I just enjoyed uh, learning from him so much. But that was, uh, Fraser, uh, you worked incredibly hard, as I remember, in the early days of RMC. Uh, you know, d designing that whole money counter. A lot of fun toys. 
Yeah, they were great. They were great toys. Why don't, why don't you tell me about the toys you worked on? Ah, this is your interview. Before, <laughs> but I didn't want to uh, let you leave the Afri uh, era with. I mean, you made a very small little comment about uh, that uh, that you and Mike Turpelak. Uh, uh, did that uh, certification prep course. Uh, I, I think that's a pretty significant event because that course pretty much without much changing, Lee, yes. uh, still exists down there today and has been the model for several other courses. Yes. And what, 30 years? What do they have on average? 30 people a year? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many uh, HPs have gone through it? That's right. Uh, I, I mean, Les and I carried those on in almost exactly the same form and format inviting the same speakers for, for years and years. It's, it remains, I think, yeah. a model for... for it's it's still going, and I remember uh, less than a few years uh, did go back and look at what was the major success factor behind people sitting for the exam, and it was going through courses like that, and probably that particular course. So uh, I think that's a very uh, major uh, impact on at least the professionalism of the society. Well, I think for us, though, one of the major impacts was all the variety of health physics problems we had to face at AFRI, all of us well, together. Yeah, there was an incredible neat. variety of problems. Fraser was, uh, remember the stack monitors on the accelerator that you had to design and build with, with no input from anybody on how to do that. And uh, uh, the, 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 all of the unexpected results from, from the monitoring of these hot animals. Remember that, Lee? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to control yeah. the hot animals. <laughs> when, they, when the angry monkeys that you were about to die from being irradiated escape and yeah. are being chased through the plant. Uh, in all three of those jobs, uh, electric boat, uh, then AFRI, and then RMC through the environmental uh, lab, or through the labs working for environmental monitoring, at nuclear power plants, uh, you you did you did environmental monitoring for you know three pretty distinct kinds of operations over you know, a pretty long time period. Why don't you contrast the differences in the environmental monitoring that happened oh, early at Electric Boat versus uh, some of the other phases we went through? There was a bunch of interesting things I know going on there. Well, at Electric Boat. Um we essentially used thin-winded GM tubes to measure everything, no matter what it was. Well, it's all they had back then, yeah. Sid, well, back not quite, when you started. <laughs> not quite true. Uh, every single time we started up a new plant for the first time, and these were all prototype nuclear plants. They'd never started one up like this before with this power. You know, we just had little, the land-based ones were like 2% of the power of the ones that we built and, and started up in, inside the submarine. In every case, they would bring in a super top secret instrument that was brought in in the dead of night, and they put up tents so nobody could see the damn thing, and they would stick it into radiation analysis. And even so, Jack Shapiro was head of it. He wasn't a chemist, and I was the chemist. And what we had to do, and this, this super top secret thing was about 15 telephone booths full of uh, vacuum tubes, and this was a 100-channel multi-channel analyzer. Nobody even knew anything like this existed. And we had to do a gross beta on the coolant right after startup and identify 80% by gamma spec of the stuff that we knew was there by gross beta. And we weren't allowed, uh, Rick Hover was a tough guy, uh, we weren't allowed to leave until we did the 80%. And some days it took us two and a half days where you stayed up the whole time doing separation. We had to do phase, we, we had to do class separations and then keep putting them on the gamma spec. I mean, it was so crude what we were doing, but that was the cat's meow, that 100-channel uh, uh, analyzer. And, and also when, uh, a little later on, uh, uh, when I was at um, uh, AFRI, I was able to see some top secret stuff that they had out uh, at the national labs that were incredible things that had almost no dead time problems whatsoever that we were able actually, if you remember, after the TMI accident to bring in and to get some of this uh, DOE, or DOD, I guess it was called then, uh, DOD equipment to help us count hot samples. Uh, do you remember they uh, brought in, um, they brought in a lab from uh, Los Alamos, portable lab. Oh. 
Oh, we were working on the low-level stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to keep a low level. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I don't think they kept that classified. But in any case, there was a huge amount of stuff that uh, was involved. But the the thing that struck me the most was what the non-DOD people had in the way of equipment and what the DOD had that they weren't willing to share. And th that bothered me a great deal, that, that, that even as late as, as the end of the 1970s, they still, they still weren't willing to share the uh, top flight stuff. And even today, if you go out uh, to Nellis Air Force Base, just north of Las Vegas, and, and you get permission, which, which I did about two years ago, to go in and talk to them about their overflight data and the material that they can, the things that they can measure from satellites and also the big helicopter arrays that they have and the fixed wing aircraft stuff that they have and the programs they have to, to instantly analyze the data, which is the thing that I guess impressed me the most. There's an incredible capability that people still aren't talking about much. And now they've taken this and all of these huge things have been now digested down into things that go into backpacks and pocketbooks and uh, briefcases that, are, that they carry, I don't know if you're familiar with, they carry around, they have a transmitter that goes to the ear mm -hmm. and they can just walk through a facility, an airport, whatever it is, and know whether or not there's any significant radioactive material there. And it's amazing that they always seem to be ahead of the curve that, that uh, you and I know about <laughs> kind of thing. And I guess uh, that's one of the things that, uh, that impresses me the most. But I guess the professionalism of environmental monitoring that has changed so much. And I think it has a lot to do with hard work with people like you that, you know, working, uh, working to make it work in the field that, that, that is so important. Yeah, technology's changed yes, technology, a lot yes. too. Uh, but uh, uh. that's the that's the thing that I, that uh, uh, impresses me the most. Well, uh, you mentioned you brought up Three Mile Island several times, and <laughs> we've got to get into that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we do. We're, we're getting late. Here. Uh, but uh, I remember a very early phone call uh, about I don't know less than. Uh, eight or ten hours after the accident had happened and you had already been there for I don't know five or six hours of that uh, so you were there right at the beginning of it we're not saying you caused it or anything but uh, uh, there, there are rumors to that effect by the way <laughs> but uh, I'm, why don't you share with us some of those uh, interesting early uh, phases of that accident not many people I think know about what went on uh, the well, first few days. First well, you know, the first few hours are the, were the thing that, the, that were the most confusing because I got called and asked, how would you expand the ramp, the radiological environmental monitoring program, into the emergency? And by the way, we had designed the ramp to be yeah. expandable into an emergency ramp. And thank God we had you done that. Preface that that uh, we at Radiation Management Corporation had the routine environmental monitoring program around Three Mile Island. So right. that was, and the other thing is that we had done was that we had uh, helped spec out. Uh, I had actually personally gone to um, the uh, Victorine factory and had witnessed the calibrations, which also we had spec'd out what uh, how they needed to be calibration to make sure they were properly calibrated, and then uh, helped um, help them with on-site installation, not installation itself, but the on-site calibrations to check out that nothing had changed from the factory and also as you know we help write the set point determination stuff like that which is very important oh. that that's the heart of an accident when an accident happens uh, you have to be able to rely on all of these monitors now they were trying to think now probably a total of 60 some channels throughout unit 2 um, uh, of, of these uh, install radiation monitors and we had some terrible problems right off the bat, and that is that when they started to release iodines, the iodines played it out on the detectors. Wait a minute, you forgot the chronology. When did the accident happen, and when did okay. you get a phone call, and when oh, were okay. you up there? Well, that the accident was very happened early. early. The accident happened somewhere between 4 and 6 a.m., as I remember. Yeah. It was very early, 
And uh, they, uh, the stack monitors that they saw started to come down. And so they thought they sort of had a handle on things. They weren't quite sure why it, why it happened, but they thought they had a handle on things. So they called me a little before 8 in the morning and wanted to know about expanding it. And so we spent some time on that, and I called up Ron Laughlin, and we talked about how we would take samples, et cetera. And then they called back about an hour later, about 9 o'clock, and said, it looks like things are beginning to settle down, and we have a handle on everything. And I said, at this point, well, I'd like to go to Salem. Uh, uh, I have some people coming down uh, uh, to the lab there. Um, uh, I have people coming down from the vendors to the lab and I, I want to see the installation of some equipment at Salem. And they said, fine, do it. And I get down to Salem uh, like an hour and a half later, which is still in the morning, and there's a phone call. You have to call the control room at TMI. And there was an unlisted number. I, 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 I recognized as the unlisted number. So I knew something was wrong. And I called up, and I guess it was Gary Miller. And he said, I talked to Herbine, and we're sending the helicopter for you. And so I knew something was wrong <laughs> when that happened. Nobody's ever sent a helicopter for me. And so, you know, so we talked for a while, and they told me about the fact that uh, they thought they had big problems uh, uh, in, in Goldsboro to the west, that they thought there had been an iodine release. They, they had measured, take, taken some charcoal samples, and they had measured iodine in them with the old uh, SAM-2s. And so uh, at that point, we kind of talked our way through it. And I asked how, many, how much noble gases were involved. And it was obvious that there was a vast amount of noble gas being released. And so at, and so at that point, we just had to, um, uh, we had to think about what are we going to do about these samples. And so the first thing I said was, don't send the helicopter from me. Take the sample, put it on the helicopter, and send it up to Maggie Riley and count it to find out whether it's truly iodine release or not. But I, so I said, from what you're telling me, I really doubt that there's the, there, all that iodine was released, but let's, let's find out. And also, uh, after I talked for a while to the people in control room, I found out they were starting to run out of filters uh, for face masks. There were a lot of things that started to run out from. And so uh, I talked to a uh, plant manager at Salem, and we had three emergency vans filled with supplies. And I drove up with the emergency vans and Jim Geller and about five or six of the staff members to help relieve. In the afternoon, these guys had been out since six in the morning. They were darn tired. And we had to have some relief. And they really didn't have the trained people that they needed to relieve all the people that had been out monitoring and taking samples. And at the same time, uh, I started to think about, well, there's going to be a turnover at 6 o'clock. I'm going to whole body count these people. And then we found out that the whole body counter uh, was sitting right next to the plant. And it was in a 1 to 200 MR per hour noble gas field that was varying back and forth. And you know better than I do, Fraser, you can't use a whole body counter under this circumstances. So we couldn't whole body count these people. And that frightened me greatly. And there were some foul ups with getting the key, if you remember. They couldn't move it. Yeah, the technician uh, was told to leave the site, and he did. <laughs> and he disappeared and took the keys. And we couldn't get the keys, so we couldn't move the thing. And so I remember taking a SAM-2 and setting up an a ad hoc thyroid counter. And each person that had been in the AUX building, I just did a quick two-minute count of his thyroid with, with the SAM-2 wrapped in lead. So it so dropped the background down a little bit to make sure that we didn't have any large, massive iodine intakes which we didn't seem to have, right. thank God. But we didn't know it at the time. I wanted these guys to be able to sleep well, too. And the same thing, uh, uh, sometime, I don't remember the timing at all, but I know I called you. That afternoon. That afternoon, I mean, because, because it was obvious. Maybe evening or something. It was, as soon as I got there, got a feel for what was going on, it was obvious that it was more than my whole group and any, any other 10 groups were going to be able to handle. And I, I frankly wanted the most reliable, best person to do whole body counting and assay of, of these critical samples that I could get. And frankly, that was you, Fraser. Uh, uh, you, you had been through it. You knew exactly what to do and how to do it. And uh, we were having big problems with uh, noble gas background veering in the labs and stuff. We had all kinds of problems. And so you mm -hmm. solved so many of those problems 
on an ad hoc basis when you got there. It was unbelievable. We had to solve them on an ad hoc basis. For the chronology, for people viewing it, that you at that time had left RMC and started your own company? Yes, I started okay. my own company about uh, two years before that. Right, and Lee Booth uh, uh, did not come up to RMC at the beginning. He went through a couple of other uh, places, NASA Goddard and a few other places, but had joined uh, RMC uh, with me in Chicago a year or two before that accident. So he was, we were back together at that time. And I remember a phone call, whatever that time it was, saying, come on out here. And you were about as nonchalant, you said, as Herbine was to, to, uh, to me, as Herbine was to you. Said, I will have this thing done in, an, in a day or two. And so I remember packing two sets of clothing, two sets of underwear for my next 30 days out there. <laughs> and Lee came out a couple days later, and then we brought our, uh, the RMC mobile van up there and started doing the environmental sample assay on site from the samples you were directing being taken of the Effluent nearby set. effluent, not right. really in the plant, but the effluent uh, well, that one could take. It was take a very complicated system, yeah. and since some of them were knocked out, we were able to use others. Mm -hmm. But we were able to get a continuous composite representative sample, which is what we had to have. And these had to be counted and counted quickly and accurately. And so if you remember, the commission, much to my amazement, got, a, uh, got, got uh, Jim Cotton got the sampling the NRC got their, or AEC, no, NRC got their uh, sampling uh, trailer up there, the mm -hmm. portable sampling trailer up there, and we round robin them between your lab and the NRC labs and the SAIC lab, I guess. Too. Well, they weren't up there for they, they weren't a couple, two or three days. Right. But, but when they came there, then we had a three-way yeah, Gems and ours were parked next to each other yeah. at the yeah. visitor center. And that's what I wanted right. was that we were so busy and there were so many problems with varying background that it was important that for the crucial samples we had the inner comparison immediately. So if there was a problem, we wouldn't lose the sample, and we could go ahead and recount them. We still lost one critical sample the first day, which I never understood how it got lost, but it did. We, we, we never found the thing. We went and looked for it and looked for it. And one crucial iodine sample that we needed. We were able to get two others that were representative of that single one that, that we wanted, but we, we did lose one. But that isn't bad out of the, there had to be tens of thousands of samples that were taken yeah. during those times. All I remember is when you're running an environmental monitoring laboratory and they bring you an environmental sample at the end of a 20-foot pole, <laughs> <laughs> you start to question whether your normal environmental counting procedures are adequate. <laughs> well, I remember uh, going into, the, in, into your lab, or, or maybe it's the NRC lab, one of the labs, and, and making a, a, a plumb bob out of a bolt and a string and taping the samples to the ceiling and opening up the top loading jelly. That's what we were doing anyway. And, I, and I, I, I'm sure I, they were doing that too. And I, I think I might have gone around to all the labs to do that. I, I, don't remember, I, I just remember doing that when it was obvious the dead time was so great. And we didn't want to wait for these things to decay. Yeah, but then we had to calibrate for those positions. Right, which is really tough. And I remember getting some uh, standards, uh, liquid standards, brought up from Philadelphia, and uh, but we didn't have any counting lab, any chemistry sample prep lab, so I scraped mm. all the radiation labels off of them, took them into the toilet of the uh, visitor center, surrounded by <laughs> all the news media, and I didn't want them to see me counting radioactive <laughs> samples around, use it to pre prepare standards. but. Uh, uh, and how long you were, were you up there uh, before getting a break to go back and uh, well, <laughs> recuperate? I, um, the first full weekend I had off was my birthday, which was June 27th, and March 28th was the accident. So that was the first two days I had off. And I, I remember that well because I, I remember telling uh, Arnold, the president of Metropolitan Edison, that I was taking the two days off and uh, a long, long ahead of time. And he said, I hate to tell you, but that's when we're releasing the Krypton 85. <laughs> and I remember having an argument about this company from somewhere in Oak, near Oak Ridge that had put in that one stack monitor there that I was really questioning the calibration. But there were like four PhDs that owned and ran the company. You know, they were workers too. And uh, 
I got overruled. Uh, I, I wanted to do an internal calibration before they used it. And they said, no, this is, this is the state of the art. Uh, we've already told the press about this, and this is what we're going to use. And I said, well, you know, if that thing over responds the way I guess it might, we're in big trouble. That, that, that's going to stop the release. And so I hadn't been with my family more than uh, maybe a day. When they started the release, the thing over responds and stops it. And how many thousand people were out there measuring Krypton? I mean, it was, a, it was one of the most publicized monitoring exercises that I had ever heard about. Or not measuring Krypton. Or not measuring Krypton, <laughs> but trying to. Right. Trying to. And so I, I remember having to abort my birthday party and go back up again. I, I, got, I got a call. I, I, I just I still remember that. But the major thing I remember is the incredible amount of work that you and your colleagues did under incredibly difficult circumstances. Uh, there were so many things that you had to overcome right after an accident to be able to count samples and count them accurately. And I was so impressed with the job that uh, you and the people that, that you were directing were, were, were doing. And Charlie Pelletier and Paul Volokwe came up for SAIC. Yeah. They did a great job. And Jim Cotton, and I forget who was in the lab with him at NRC, but everybody worked together. There were no petty differences that I could see at all. Everybody worked you know, 18, 20 hours a day, did their best, uh, overcame problems, worked together. And the, the output was horrendous. It was enormous, the, the amount of data that we were able to get out. 7.30 every morning, I was at the plan of the day meeting, seven days a week, taking the effluent data and, and letting them know, also faxing it to Maggie Riley at the state so the state would have it right away. And Maggie and I had this unwritten agreement. The state got it before the NRC got it. And that was only fair. I mean, the, the, the accident was, was in Pennsylvania State. And of course, the NRC were always there bugging us for data, if you remember, in the, in the trailer all the, all the time. And I was told to come up for one or two days. And I guess three years later, we finally closed the, closed the trailer down and left. Uh, Steve well, it Gertz, expanded, uh, I don't know how many trailers. Oh, you know, oh yeah, we, we had four <laughs> trailers worth of people. But Steve Gertz ran the off-site environmental monitoring program and did a superb job. It was amazing that in all that confusion, off-site, not one sample got lost. And that's due to the hard work of Ron Laughlin. Remember what a professional he is uh, in, in doing the sampling. And he oversaw a series of students that, that had been trained and, and doing and taking and picking up all those samples. Uh, and we really generated a huge amount of data. And in the lawsuits that followed, it's that data that won the lawsuit for us. We would have been lost in that huge TMI class action lawsuit without having the data and the quality of the data, because it was checked and rechecked and rechecked. And so between all the utility work that was done, all the work that you did in SAIC and the NRC and the accounting labs, uh, all the work the DOD did, the, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, gee, the people from Brookhaven, the people from, uh, from Bettis. I'm trying to think. They just came from all over. Uh, the people from Hassel, Health and Safety Labs. Uh, quality work, huge amount of data. And it was an overwhelming amount of data. And I had the privilege or the terrible job of putting all that together later on uh, in the, uh, to put together the story of what happened in the environment. And, and to win that lawsuit, which if that lawsuit or had been lost. Or what didn't happen in the environment. Or what, what didn't happen. <laughs> but if that lawsuit had been lost, that mm -hmm. could have shut down all the plants in the yeah. United States because, um, there, because of the fact that the cost would have been billions of dollars in insurance dollars. And so that, that was a, a difficult responsibility. And, and uh, at at PCI, I had a wonderful group of people that I work with, and of course, colleagues like you. Uh, you were with, at Canberra at that point, I guess. Yeah, almost. Canberra had bought RMC. I had bought, uh, I bought RMC. Uh, after TMI, I seem to remember you doing a lot of work uh, uh, having to do with uh, skin exposure calculations, uh, hot particle calculations, you all know, of that whole. 
Well, one of the things that we learned was much that, ado about yeah, nothing kind of stuff. <laughs> one of the things that we learned was that we didn't know really how to properly set up personal dosimetry, TLD or film badges, for measuring skin exposure when we have very high and very low energy betas involved with photons. Did that start related to TMI work, or was that unrelated to, to no, the TMI No, that was related. Accident? What we had was that five months after the accident, we had the makeup valve room incident. Oh, okay. And that's an incident where there were large releases. At that point in time, the primary coolant was still 350 picocuries per gram which is a huge amount. I mean, the average plant runs at one or two or three or four kind of thing if it's, if, if it's a clean plant. And, if, and five months later, it's still 350, and it's all mostly high energy betas. And we had a release then. We had people that went in to tighten the bonnets to try to stop the release. They were stop, stop watched in and out. They surveyed very carefully all the boron crystals that they saw because uh, there was a lot of boron in, 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 the, in the gaseous release, and that would play it out, and you could see the crystals. Nobody thought to look at the floor, and the great majority of the, of the dose was coming from the floor, and we were monitoring the pipes that were three feet off the ground, not realizing the majority of the dose was coming from the floor. We also looked at the pocket ion chambers, which were way up here on the person's chest, because you remember those PCs had real high pockets in them. Mm -hmm. And the dose was on the floor. And therefore, we weren't getting a representative dose. And so these guys, all of them got less than one rad exposure, uh, or one rem, if you want to call it that. It shouldn't be called that, uh, to the pocket ion chamber. But we weren't particularly looking for betas. And uh, we thought that uh, these people, everybody got less than one rat exposure. They were in for two or three minutes at a time. There were three sets of two people. Uh, and it's when they read the TLDs. And all the TLDs read more than 200 rats. And then we found out that there was massive, massive infiltration through the 300 milligram per square centimeter, which was the deep dose filter of the standard Harshall badge there. And we found out that that whole design was absolutely inadequate for measuring high, high energy betas. And we actually had no way to interpret the badges. And we studied this. Uh, Sammy Sherbini, who's a brilliant physicist, came in to help study this. We had a lot of people that, that worked. Uh, Joe Seg came in. We had a lot of brilliant uh, dosimetrists that came in to work on this. And we knew that the thing was inadequate. It was wrong, or not wrong. It was just inadequate for the job. And when I went to the national labs to get help, they all fudged it, it turned out. And that was a, so it turned out we really didn't know how to measure betas very well. And from that came the first international beta symposium from what we learned we didn't know from that accident. Uh, and it was a very humbling experience to not be able to adjudicate badges that read two, 200 rads or more from all six people that went into the makeup valve room. And so that was a wonderful learning experience. And so I had kind of fun after going through all that. It was a terrible time. Uh, at the, it was terrible for having to go through it for me and the whole staff there, uh, Gordon Lottie, and I'm um, trying to think all the gang that was there. There was a wonderful group of people that were, that were working with me there. Um, but once we learned the lessons, we were able to go around and teach classes. And so there was a lot of teaching that went on uh, throughout the whole nuclear power industry on on how to measure betas. And as a matter of fact, we had a horrendous beta problem at three or four other plants since then. And we were able to take these lessons learned and go right in and do a good job because of it. Uh, Palo Verde had mm -hmm. a, a vast problem uh, uh, there with uh, some uh, wearable uh, bearings that they had on the primary coolant pumps that were supposed to go to Germany but didn't go. And, and so uh, we had, they had huge betas. Uh, we had to start from scratch with, with the TLDs, et cetera. But we were able to do it because we had that experience of TMI. So we were able to go in. Uh, and so hopefully this lesson learned on the difficulty of measuring betas you know, has been well learned. And now that I think the fuel is much, more, much better now than it was, much more reliable, with much less leaks, et cetera, the beta problem is slowly going away. Uh, it was, it, we had a hot particle problem for a while, and we, yeah. also, we also learned a lot from that. 
And I had to think back then to my early days at, a, at Electric Boat when we had hot particle problems. But we didn't solve it then. We just picked the hot particles off. <laughs> and we, we, we didn't know much river. about that then, as a matter of fact. So um, again, it's learning from, uh, it's lessons learned. And uh, as uh, Joe Soldat just said a few hours ago when I was interviewing him, Hopefully, the newer generation of health physicists will not have to relearn on, uh, these lessons, will not have to reinvent the wheel, but will be able to go back and learn from the experiences of people before them. Well, only if they do what Joe also said, which is go back and look at the literature and read and, or talk to people. Ab uh, absolutely. And, so, and my, my big pleasure has been uh, you know, associated uh, you know, with Fine professionals like you, uh, working within, uh, working in the, uh, going to the meetings, Health Physics Society, meeting people, discussing problems. I really feel in some ways you learn more by sitting in the halls with a one-to-one -one conversation than you do by going to the papers. But you learn from both, mm -hmm. of course. Because often you go to the papers and you figure out that who it is you have to go talk to. Right. Uh, just because this is going uh, to be uh, kept as a history record, we have to explain why Lee Booth left. It wasn't because he's uh, tired of uh, listening to Sid, although he might that, be. that may be, but we, <laughs> we don't have to admit that right now. He's uh, uh, this year the uh, uh, president of the American Academy of Health Physics, and uh, they are doing their uh, annual meeting that's starting right now, and he had to go to, for it. But uh, I have two final questions, mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're very highly technical. Uh, uh -oh. uh, one of them uh, is that uh, you've told me a lot personally about uh, your daughter and uh, how proud you are of her and the things she's doing. Uh, you should share that with the rest of us. Oh, yes. Uh, um, my daughter Dawn, uh, who is in her mid-30s now and has produced two wonderful grandchildren that I'm very proud of as a chemical engineer and then went to Wharton and uh, is, is now a uh, uh, productive, hard-working professional, and both she and her husband are, are MBAs, and uh, I'm just very proud of the fact that, that she has the uh, work ethic that I think is so important, and also the intellectual curiosity. Why is it that I'm having problems, not just how do I solve them? And if you can, one can instill in their children the intellectual curiosity and the work ethic to, to keep after problems and not to take the easy way out, I think you can succeed in almost anything. Well, That's one of the things that impressed me about you. You had well, a wonderful work ethic when I met you. I know where she got that, uh, that uh, stimulation. And then the last question, I've asked you about comparing environmental monitoring programs, health physics operations at various facilities. Now, you've been at uh, Electric Boat, which is on the Thames River and the Connecticut River, and you've been down to Affery, which is near Chesapeake Bay, and ended up at RMC in Philadelphia on the Delaware River. Uh, compare the uh, sailing experiences in, uh, <laughs> in all of those. Well, certainly for summer sailing, there's no place like Long Island Sound. Uh, it's the best sailing. But for interesting ports of call, there's no place like the Chesapeake Bay, which is 250 miles long. And I was born on the bay uh, in the summers. We used to sail and, and be on the bay. And I'll never see 50% of the ports of call in my lifetime on the bay. And so that's, that's the most interesting. If it only had the winds that they have in chess. So there is no ideal place. You have to kind of you know, pick your place and, and, and adapt to it. The thing is to have a love of things like sailing and scuba diving. And you and I have scuba dived together. And I, I've loved those experiences. And I hope that we're able to continue to do things like that for many years to come. Yep, I do too. So thank you very much, Fraser. Thank you. Appreciate it.